Welcome to another message from Citizen Heights. We are located in the nation's capital, where our heart is to inspire hope, remove limitations, and help you experience God's possible for your life. Join Pastors Michael and Heather Giroux in their passion to help you live your best life. We hope you enjoy today's encouraging and uplifting message. Hey Amen. Anybody ready for some revival in here today? Anybody on our online campus, give yourself a uh, screen name, join in the chat, let your amen be heard uh, wherever you're watching, listening today. But for those in the room, do you have your Bibles with you? Yeah, you got your Bible with you? Let's go ahead and open together. We're going to go to Nehemiah chapter 4 as we uh, get ready today for what I believe uh, is going to be a word with a, with a, with a mission A word with an application, word with a next step that comes with an opportunity to step into the truth that we're going to hear about today. And so I'm going to ask our our hosts right now just to, if you would, grab a stack of those Team Express cards, journey up and down the aisles, and uh, here they come. Look at this. If we missed you somehow on the way in and you missed a Team Express card, would you just wave to one of our hosts that are moving through right now and make sure you get one of those cards because I believe that that will help you take the step that we're going to to describe for you this morning. Does that make sense? So if you didn't get one of those cards, go ahead and just wave to them. I believe we have an online edition and version for you as well. Hopefully you're grabbing hold of that. And uh, I I appreciate last week we had Daryl Dudley give a great word and a great story and a a powerful testimony of what God has done. And we're we're all part of that story and testimony as uh, many of you have been praying for Daryl. And so I appreciated him sharing a little bit of that journey um, while Heather and I and our whole family was gone last week celebrating the marriage of our son. Our eldest son, Caden, uh, uh, married Brooklyn. Now understand, it's a new age, and so social media and, and creative uh, control of the brand of Caden in Brooklyn, it was under wraps, but I've been given permission to share one photo. I, I unwisely shared some photos earlier in the week on Instagram. I was notified very quickly. I did not have authorization to do that, so that post was deleted. Uh, but I, I, we do have this photo. Hopefully, uh, the team has it ready and can share it. And maybe not. Just tell me if you're not ready for it, and I'll move on. I can't see a thing up there. You'll have to use. I'm just going to move on. Uh, but celebrating uh, with our family, all the feels that come with it. And uh, it was it was amazing. Um, people who tell you to focus on your career first, let me just tell you, family is a God authored priority. <laughs> that's a that's a God authored priority. So you'll never regret the time you you spend with family, honoring family, building family. So uh, be encouraged. Even in Washington D.C., you can build a family. And you can do it God's way. And uh, we, we just had an amazing celebration with a lot of friends and family as our oldest got married. And uh, they can't wait. I was talking to him on the phone. He said, Dad, we get in super late Saturday night, but we'll be at the Dulles campus first thing in the morning. We can't wait to start building the church and building people and being there. And I probably would have given him a pass, but he's my son. And, and he, he he's already tracked into the vision and the the joy it is to build people and the privilege it is. So let's go ahead. Do you have Nehemiah 4 now? Because we're going to kind of talk about this today. So let's get in it together. We've been reading uh, Nehemiah 4, repeating verse 15 every week to kind of as a springboard into our text. And of course, you're always invited to open the Citizen Heights app and to follow along as we have discussion notes in there that'll make it easy to track along and be a part of it. So Nehemiah chapter 4 verse 15 says, Our enemies heard that we had found out what they were plotting, and they realized that God had defeated their plans. Then all of us, say all of us, all of us went back to rebuilding the wall. 
And we've been talking about the rees of God, what God will do once more. God's mission is not simply to restore what was, but to take what was to another step from glory to glory. Sometimes what breaks and God restores never really looks like what it used to look like, but it is better than it ever could have been had God not touched it. And God is restoring, and it is something that all of us get to be part of. Aren't you glad? Poke your neighbor and say, all of us. All of us means you. Poke them now. All of us means you. All of us. Because we, we started talking two weeks about a concept I, did, I admit I did not get very far in. I, I failed miserably in my attempts to establish it, but we were going somewhere. So let's just, if you weren't here, we were talking about uh, I can still be in process and be part of God's purpose. I can still be in process, in, in the processes of God, in the rees of God, the restoration and the rebuilding and repenting and, and all the things that God does to reform us and reestablish us and realign us. I can still be in God's process and still find joy and an active hand in God's process or purpose. And his purpose is people. His purpose is building people. But it's going to take all of us. Say all of us. Yeah, it's something happens when it's all of us. Not just some of us or a few of us or one of us or two of us. But all of us create something that, because there's some things that I can't do alone. There's certain things that are, are not going to be accomplished by yourself. And Nehemiah in this passage, we understand as we've looked at it for a few weeks, that he has a big task ahead, right? He's literally rebuilding the broken walls of Jerusalem. So Jerusalem has been under siege, attacked, the walls broken down, left uh, as, as a reminder of the defeat. And here comes a generation that doesn't even remember what the walls looked like. And they're being tasked to rebuild from the broken, burnt, busted rubble of what used to be. And what are they rebuilding? They're rebuilding Jerusalem, a place of God's protection and a place of God's blessing. And what we've been talking about is even as they were building, every generation has a building assignment. Every generation is on assignment and has a building and a rebuilding project. Jesus had a building project, right? Hello, anybody here? We talked about it in Matthew 16. I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Listen, no matter what your profession, you have an eternal purpose, and God's commissioned you to be part of building his church. You don't need to be a, an ordained pastor. You don't need to be able to sing like Crystal or, or do announcements like Pastor David and Guyana. Are they the most optimistic, energetic people. You just get around them and you feel like, you know what? God's going to do something great. Listen, God wants to use you and activate you in God's purposes even though you're still in his processes. And we have a building project. When Nehemiah wrote this passage, they were re rebuilding the stone walls. But that wasn't really the big task. Rebuilding the walls, it's, it's manual labor. The big challenge was reviving the hearts of the people who are building. That's where the battle was, right? And revival is all about people. Revival is loving and lifting people into the forgiveness of God. But it's also building and activating people's gifts into the family of God. That's why we always say at Citizen Heights, we can't be everything we're supposed to be until you're who God's called you to be. Because that means we're missing a stone, we're missing a brick, we're missing a doorway, we're missing a window. The way Corinthians talks about it, it talks about parts of the body. It talks about fingers on the hand, earlobes. Come on, some of us are the tragus, this little nubby thing right here. Some of us are the, the hand or the foot. Some of us are, we, we all are necessary to be a full expression of the body of Christ. But we can't be a full expression. We read funny to the world when we're missing pieces. Have you ever tried to take a book and just rip out every third page and then read it with any type of uh, uh, understanding and comprehension? 
No, because you've eliminated a third of the storyline, the narrative, the arc, the details. And sometimes we show up to church, but we don't show up to church. You know what I mean? You can show up to church, but still not show out as the church. And when people start reading the church, they're like, man, I just can't follow this line. Like, are we missing? Yeah, when the church is missing you, it's missing part of the storyline. Are you okay? Is everybody good? Revival is always about people. It's always about God reviving you, but then through you, reviving others. So it's always about God's purpose. So, so, so there are external and physical barriers that Nehemiah had to overcome to build these walls, and, and some that we have to overcome. But more important, there are some spiritual, internal barriers that we have to overcome, right? There's an internal battle, the battle upstairs, the battle in the mind, and, and, and coming to that place of believing does God really want to rebuild me? Does God really still have something for me? Does God still like me? Does God still accept me? Does God, I mean, I know God knows the real me, so probably God is not too thrilled with me. But here's the, the truth. That the battle in the mind, the playlist of the mind, remember we started talking two weeks about playlists, and, and then we started talking about music and, and uh, you know, um, putting together a playlist and I was just going down memory lane because now it's so easy to make a playlist nowadays and and whether you use Pandora or Spotify and the algorithms it'll just select from your from what it's learned about you and your preferences but back in the day we did not have playlist assistance like that in fact we didn't call it a playlist at all we called it a mixtape and to make a mixtape you had to have a cer certain apparatus a double deck tape deck and you would put the two tapes in and, and pause one and hit record pause on the other. And you ha have to cue it up and, and then hit play and, and actually listen to it in real time as it recorded itself on the other tape. And then quick hit pause again and then line up the next song that you wanted on your mixtape. And because there was so much in the process of capturing it, there was great uh, care taken in what songs made it on to the mixtape, right? You didn't just choose any song. It had to go through a choosing process. And this past week, I had to make the playlist for the rehearsal dinner. And my wife told me that afternoon, she's like, hey, we don't have a playlist for the rehearsal dinner. I said, okay, uh, what's the time slot we need to cover? And she goes, uh, five hours. I said, five hours? That's due to handpick every song. Uh, and because of the convenience of drag and drop and just add to playlist, it, it still took some selectiveness, I want you to know, because I think for every one song about true love, there's three songs about jaded love. And so you can't have a song sneak its way into the rehearsal dinner that is lamenting the loss of love or, or the brokenness of the relationship. And so I'm, I'm, I'm running through trying to get five hours discerning criteria for these songs, special songs that celebrated love, you know, hopeful songs, expectant songs. Because there's a lot riding on it, right? Listen to me now. There are internal battles and internal barriers you are fighting and you will continue to fight and you can no longer listen to the melodies and the, the hypnotic beats of a song and a spirit that is not God's design for you it's not expectant for your future it's, it's something else it's not hopeful about what God will do it's, it's something else it's not celebrating the love of God the purposes of God even the process of God it's something else. And yet it snuck onto your mixtape. It got onto your playlist. And it becomes something in your ears. I was talking to somebody earlier. I just so appreciate it. I just bumped into somebody here as I'm walking around uh, before church began. And I said, how are you doing? And they said, they were honest. They said, not good. I went, how's work? And they're like, that's what's not good. I said, well, what can we be praying for? He said, and they just said, it, I'm where I'm supposed to be. I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. And it's just not a great season, but it's going to be okay. 
And I appreciated that even though the, the, there's rubble around you sometimes, right? There's, there's broken down walls, there's issues, problems, and things that we need God to move on. But in the midst of knowing there's restoration to be done, there's still hope and expectation that God will do it. They're listening to the right playlist. So we've been discussing these four internal barriers, right, that we have to deal with that become barriers to, to us becoming an all-of-us church. Uh, the first week, I'm not going to fall prey to the same trap that I fell to two weeks ago. I want you to know, some of you are like, he's, he's walking right into it. He's doing it again. As I review, sometimes I get caught reemphasizing something that, but repetition is the heart and soul of learning and the, the bedrock of culture. And so sometimes you have to repeat things. But I'm just going to give you a quick headline. The first week, we talked about, I'm too busy, the distracted spirit. Remember, we're talking about God reviving some internal things that distracted people. Distracted spirit. It's it's talking about God's people being in God's house. Because when I live distracted, I I, I start neglecting things that God says are important for my life. Right? Second week, we talked about, "I'm I'm too offended, an unforgiving spirit. Right? And we talked about how God's forgiving family is in God's house. And that if we're going to be family, we have to be actively forgiving one another. And so we we looked at three repeatables when offense comes. Because if you're new at Citizen Heights, you think that we're just all amazing, happy, wonderful people. Uh, But time in time, uh, we will be imperfect in some way, shape, or form. And you will think, I'm offended. Well, when offenses come, we have three little repeatables around here, don't we, church? The first one is, I am unoffendable when offenses come, meaning Jesus' forgiveness of my sins is the key to me forgiving others. That's how I can be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another just as I was forgiven, uh, as Christ, God in Christ forgave me. And so, our, our first repeatable is, I'm unoffendable when offense comes. Anybody agree with that? Second one is, I am biblical when offense comes. Matthew 18 says there's a biblical way to handle it when offense comes. That means if I can't just forgive you in and of myself and let it go, if I need to have a conversation, I'm going to have the conversation with you face to face. And we're going to deal with that. Matthew 18 talks about going to that person face to face. And finally, number three, we said we're going to be mature and durable, so when different opinions come, we don't calculate that as an offense. Right? An offense is when somebody has wronged you. Someone believing what you don't is not an offense, it's a different opinion. And so if you make spiritual unity dependent on non-eternal affinities, like, well, I thought they would think like I do on this front or that front, well, you're going to miss out on what God designed to grow you. You're going to miss out on what God designed to sharpen you. God made room for you and me and all of our stuff. Now we're not going to make room for other people's stuff. And if their stuff is just a different opinion, guess what? The stuff is yours. Anyway, I'm not getting any amends on that, but tell you what, you'll have a thriving community, a family that loves you and sees you through stuff. Even when they don't agree with you, they love you anyway, right? So today's point Number three, I'm too broken. A wounded and discouraged spirit. I'm too broken. See, that's one of the mental things. God, revive us because we think we're too broken. We we have a wounded and discouraged spirit, but we need a revelation that God's healing community is in God's house. God's house is a healing community for you. And let's be honest, marriages go through tough times. Sometimes marriages end and leave you shattered. Your kids go through rough stuff. The heartache of watching your child in a difficult season. I don't know if there's anything difficult, more difficult than that. I heard one person say that you're never more happy than your saddest child. And Heather and I can attest, it's true. So marriages, children, sickness, negative diagnosis, financial difficulty, uh, financial setbacks, loss of loved ones, mental health struggles. There are difficult, tough things, tough seasons. Prolonged difficulties bring a weariness to the soul. They bring trauma 
and Nehemiah is dealing with this. So I want to show you something about a wounded, discouraged spirit. And let's pray that God today can breathe and revive your heart and revive us as a people that say we're the ones who take up others who are in that place of wounded, in that place of brokenness, in that place of not there yet, but need someone to triage them, need somebody to carry them, need someone to love them where they are and believe that God's got something more for their future. Amen? So let me show you something. Wounded, discouraged spirit. In Nehemiah, we're talking about Nehemiah, and he's dealing with something. How, how bad is it? Look at this in, in chapter 4, verse 10. Look at, look at what Nehemiah is working with. And this is specifically about the people, the tribe of Judah. Most of you know there's 12, actually 12 and a half tribes of Israel. One of the tribes split. That's why we have 12 and a half. And one of the tribes was the tribe of Judah. And it says in verse 10 of Nehemiah 4, a team will put this up so you can see it. It says, the people of Judah had a song they sang. They've got a playlist. They made a mixtape. And listen, it says, they had a song they sang, and the lyrics go something like this. We grow weary and weak carrying burdens. There's so much rubble to take away. How can we build the wall today? That's their song. Like, that's their lyrics. The people of Judah are singing about the difficulty, singing about their weakness and weariness, singing about a, a, a questioning of their ability to be in the purposes of God when things are still so messed up. The people of Judah, for those of you who know, the tribe of Judah, this song, that's their playlist. We can't build for the future because we're, we're too busy picking up the rubble of yesterday, the pieces of a broken past, the pieces of, of unfulfilled expectations, the pieces of a marriage that didn't end the way I thought it would, or my kids being in a season I can't help them out of. I'm too wounded, I'm too discouraged, I'm too broken, this is my song. Now when you, when you read this, uh, that it's, we're talking about the tribe of Judah. This is the tribe, listen, some of you already know what that means, but let me get everybody caught up. This is the tribe of Judah. Jesus is coming from the tribe of Judah. He, this is the messianic portal of where Jesus will come from. He is the lion of the tribe of, hello, anybody here? The, that's the roar of the Messiah, the majesty of the Messiah, the victory of the Messiah, right? Let the redeemed of the Lord say something because the righteous are as bold as a lion drawing from the lion from the tribe of Judah, the one who backs down from no uh, uh, foe and, and finds victory in every battle. Revelation 5, 5 says, don't weep. See the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. He's conquered so that he can open up the scroll of the seven seals and, be de and begin to declare and sing over you. The lion of the tribe of Judah is going to sing over you. The strength of the lion, the ferocity and the, 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 the nobility, the monarchy of all eternity. We're talking about Jesus. This is the lion of the tribe of Judah. And, and so let's just go back. Tribe of Judah, what's on your playlist? They're singing a song that was never designed for them. They're singing a song that would defeat them and discourage them in the plans that God had for them. And yet here they are. Can I, can I tell you something today? Be careful to examine the soundtrack of the tribe that you're running in. Be careful to examine the soundtrack of the tribe that you're hanging out with. Is it faith? Is it expectation? Is it God is good? Is it God's not done yet? Is it God's got more for you? Is it God can come through in that situation? Or is it we can't build the wall today? We're just so weary. You ever get a song caught in your head? Anybody here? Church, you're going to activate a little bit here. Anybody ever get a song caught in your head? Have you ever purposely sung a song so it would get stuck in another person's head? 
Because there are songs that just stick in a person's head. They call it an earworm. I read this, uh, there's an article by Psychology, Psychology Today talking about what makes a song stick in your head. And uh, if you ever come out of a Washington Nationals game, I guarantee you're singing a song. Do you know what song it is? It's eighth inning. Aha. Uh -huh. Take on me. Take on me. Take me on. Take. Uh, you know what going to sing? Nobody can get up that high. Right? And it just gets stuck in your head. Everybody's walking out of the park. Just take me. How'd that get stuck in my head? There's something. It, it does something to you. Then you're done for the day. Repeating uh, for the rest of the day, that song's in your head. Why? Because the people you're with were singing it, and you were all singing it together. And when you sing it and you sing it all together, it becomes a soundtrack and, a, and, a, and almost, almost a, an anthem of, of your expectations. And so here we are. If, if all you have is you to deal with your hurt and your brokenness, you're in trouble. Because the people around you provide soundtrack. They provide the melody. They provide the rhythm. They provide some of the things that you and I are leaning on. Now, I know we lean on the Lord, and, we, and, and that's a great place to lean, but God puts people in your life. And if you're not uh, being careful about the people that you put in your life, that's why I say revival, the church once more. Because the church God has in mind believes in you and will lift you up and will stand with you in tough times and will help you get that bill paid and will pray you through to that better job and will uh, uh, be there to comfort you when your child is going through the storms of life. The church that Jesus has in mind is a family and it's a community. And that doesn't happen just because we show up on Sunday, it happens because we open our hearts to one another. And we say, you know, sing that song to me again. That song about how God was faithful in your life. And that song about how God brought you through that difficult time. And that song about how God has never left one behind and is continues. That he, he, he watches over his word to perform it. And he sees us through. See, if all you have is people who get you singing about your past, singing about who you used to be, who you ought to be, who left you, who hurt you, who didn't want you, who'd... If, if that's what you're singing about, you need God's people with a soundtrack of faith. Come on, God's community activates healing. There are things that I've walked through in my life that I never could have walked through alone. In fact, I probably would not have seen them I probably would have been oblivious to them. But you get in church, and somebody invites you to a citizen group. And you think, well, it's a basketball citizen group. How, how dangerous can that be? Well, if Timmy's in it, it's very dangerous. A little too physical for men who are not under contract. You, you go, well, it's a, it's a citizen group. It's team. It's team express. I'll just get on a team. How dangerous can that be? And all of a sudden, it, it's all an excuse to get into relationship. It's all an excuse to, so that we can activate, activate you in God's purpose, but at the same time get you connected to people who are going to help you in God's process. Where all of a sudden, somebody knows that you, see, because our, what we're believing God for is we want more for you than we want from you. Pastor, why do you want people on team? Well, is it because you want our gifts? Is it because I'm administrative and you want me on the office or I'm technical and you want me in the booth? Listen, do I want your gifts activated? Absolutely, because activated gifts grow. And so those who are invested are always being multiplied to grow. But more than that, I want you in relationships that will notice when you're not here, that will call you when you're not around, somebody that you can text when you're on the ledge and you need someone to talk you down. Those are the relationships that happen in the context of community, and God's community activates my healing. It's all an excuse. You need God's people with a soundtrack of faith. I got to land this really quickly, and I will. Did was that laughter? Was that an unbelieving spirit? No, we're talking about a wounded and broken spirit. L listen. Two things that you, you'll see right here. First John 1 John 1.9. If we confess our sins to God, he is faithful. He is just to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So understand, cleansing and forgiveness, it comes from God, right? 
That's the beginning of our journey into community. It begins right there. But understand, James 5, 16, it says, Therefore confess your sins to who? Each other, one another. And then it says, pray for each other. Confess to each other. Pray for each other so that you may be healed. We, we quote the second part of that verse so many times. The effect of fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. And we, we quote that all the time. Look, your prayers are powerful. The, you can accomplish much as you pray. But the context of that is you're praying for one another. It's us. It's all of us coming together. See, you go to God for forgiveness, 1 John 1.9. But you go to God's people for healing. Confess. Pray with one another so that you would be healed. James 5, 16. I go to God, I'm forgiven. God's people begin to activate my healing. And as I walk in shoulder to shoulder in community with people, there's things that come up. Ugly things sometimes. Things that trigger you. And you go, whew, where did that come from? That really wasn't about you. That was about something from my past that happened to me. And now I'm just kind of projecting that weird thing on you. But it's coming up. And, but, but now I'm in this relationship where I have to love one another. And I'm serving one another. And as I love you and serve you and pray for you, I can't be mad at you. I got to work through this with you. And many times that operation of working it through ends up activating healing in you. That healing that comes. All of us. It's how we get through it, amen? That's why Citizen Heights, we've got growth track. We want to take you through through classes. Keisha, what's our, what's our track today? Essentials class. And you take the essentials class. You say, I don't, I, why am I taking these three classes? B because we want you growing in God. Three classes won't do it, but it'll get it started. And so we get you in those three classes, and you start growing in God, and you start growing in community, because we're all in process. But we all want to be activated in God's purpose. And some of us have been waiting on the sidelines, thinking someday I'll get there. Someday I'll be mature enough. Someday I won't have any more issues. And Listen, I'm, I'm almost 40 years in. I have not run out of issues yet. But we have a God who loves us and, and allows us to be in process, but also to have purpose. Team, getting on team. Citizen groups, getting in citizen groups. Why? Healing. Healing. God's community. See, your life's destiny and fulfillment is by God's design going to take all of us. It's going to take all of us. I love a church that has that mindset, all of us right? A church that says, Whew, you're good at what you do. And, and bumps, bruises, marks, scars, we love you like Jesus loves you. Yeah, but I kind of snapped and I shouldn't have said that. It's forgiven. Let's keep going for God. You know, when you're building a wall, there's elbows thrown. You know, sometimes you some of the mortar and the materials falls on the person and the, the scaffolding below. And there's just an understanding that, no, we have a united purpose. We're building something here. And once in a while, we're going we're gonna to color outside the lines that's going to cause hurt. We're not going to treat it flippantly, but we're also not going to build memorials to our offense or our hurt or our brokenness. We're going to build memorials to Jehovah Rapha, the God who heals, the God who gets me past my issues, the God who says, don't just build a memorial. You know, we, we build memorials to our pain, and we build memorials to our hurt. And I would rather build a memorial to the God who can heal me from it and get me beyond it and, and, and get me through it So because he's got purpose that, that you're going to see things you never would have seen had you not walked through that season. You're going to spot pain in other people that never would have been spotted. But you have an eye for it now. Why? Because you've walked in those shoes. And you have a sensitivity to that pain. You say, God works all things together for good, but why did he allow it? Well, we live in a fallen world. 
It's not that God has an assignment of difficulty to hurt you, but when the enemy who comes to steal, kill, and destroy tries to ravage you, God comes in to restore you. And then somehow beautifully uh, it weaves purpose in the midst of that pain and says, not only will you be a trophy of grace that you've risen from these ashes, but you're going to build into this wall. And the gate and the doorway that you your frame houses is going to be a doorway for people with that sim similar pain and that similar loss and that similar journey because you have an eye for it now. Come on, there's healing in God's house. We're not wounded wanderers living a fragmented life, right? We're wonderfully saved. We're forgiven. We're being healed. We're being restored as we're on purpose. Can I pray for you this morning? Wherever you are, maybe online campus, close your eyes. Close your eyes right here in the room. And let's give a moment to build an altar to the Lord. To say, God, be the God who heals. Be the God who comforts. Father, we thank you that we're a community of faith. And we lean on you right now. We thank you, Holy Spirit that you see us, you know us, you know every detail about us. And we just lay bare that place of our heart. A wounded spirit is more than just hurt feelings. It's not something shallow and small. A wounded spirit is that thing that happened or those words that were spoken or that incident that left us scarred and deeply marked. And we've had a difficult time just finding our way through it. We can't heal ourselves, but we know the great physician, Jesus, knows you. He sees that pain. And we ask right now, Father, that you would begin your healing work by the power of the Holy Spirit, but also by the purpose of God and his community, that, Lord, we would be those who would confess where we've been, what's happened to us. We would find relationships in your house that we can be honest with, we can be vulnerable with, we can be open with. And as we share those hurts and those problems, God, your word says that we will be prayed for by one another and we will be healed. So we come to you today, God. We put our hope in you, but we also understand that the hand of God is many times seen in the heart of his community, the heart of his family. So God, we put ourselves in connection. Lord, let the playlist of heaven that we unite our lives to be one of faith, be one of expectation, be one that God is not done and finished with me yet, that God can still redeem and realign and restore and do everything that he purposed to do in my life. There are no latecomers. There are no, uh, no, um, there's no limit on the offer that you've given for restoration, for healing. It's never too late to become everything that you've called us to be. It's never too late to walk in the purposes of God that you have for us. So we say yes to you, Jesus. Just as a church, we say yes to you. We're a community of faith. We're on a rescue mission to serve this world. We're loved by God. We're healed by one another. So God, we pray you'd activate every gift. And even as we go from this place to Team Express, God, we would... We would hold these cards as a holy admonition, a holy assignment, a sacred trust that, God, you've put gifts in our lives that the church needs to be the full expression of your goodness to the world around it. God, we would not hold those back, but we would put them in your hands. We would say, here we are, Lord. We want to serve. We thank you that your example to us is that, Jesus, you did not come to be served, but to serve. God, that we would activate ourselves and we would come to serve. With every eye closed, I want to pray just a quick prayer for those who be in this room and say, I understand what you're talking about, serving, getting on a team, being healed. But that thing you said about 1 John 1, 9, we go to God for forgiveness. The Bible says, all have sinned and fall short of God's glory. And because of that sin, we can never repair ourselves or redeem ourselves. We must receive redemption and forgiveness from Jesus. And maybe 
if you were to be honest today and really examine your heart, you don't know where you stand with God. You don't know that you're forgiven by God. You don't have a confidence that God loves you, has forgiven you, and has a plan for you. It'd be my privilege right now to lead us all in a prayer, all of us nice and loud, all together. I'm not going to call you out of your seat. I'm not going to call any attention to you. But I am going to ask you to lift your hand by lifting your hand saying, I know Jesus is the answer I've been looking for. It might be the first time you've ever done this. It might be a recommitment moment because you just, you know you need to get right with God. And I'm going to count to three. When I hit three, you're just going to lift your hand. You're not joining a church today, but you're saying, God, I need your forgiveness. One, don't wait. Today is your day. Two, he loves you right where you are, but he loves you too much to leave, we, leave you where you are. Hands are already going up. One, two, three, hands in there. Say, yeah, that's me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else say, Pastor, include me in that prayer. Nice and high, if you don't mind. It's hard to see in here. Thank you. Got you. Thank you. Online, you can just lift your hand right where you are. It's a sign of universal surrender. You're just saying, Jesus, I surrender to your plan for my life. And I receive the forgiveness you have for me. Are you ready? Let's pray this prayer with those who have raised their hands. And maybe you didn't raise your hand, but you know this is for you. Dear Jesus, I give you my life because you first gave me yours. I love you, Jesus, because you first loved me. So I give all I am, all I used to be, and all I hope to be. I give my life to you. Now say this boldly, I am a Christian, by grace I've been saved, in Jesus' name, amen. Come on, let's rejoice with those who just prayed that prayer.